Hello everyone, Science and Ponies here once again celebrating 500 subscribers with another video explaining some physics with ponies. This time around, instead of the usual quantum mechanics and nuclear physics stuff, I'm actually covering a little something you might actually encounter in a high school physics class. We're going to talk about where rainbows come from and a little bit more on optics. Let's get right into it. First off is light. Light is fast very very fast. It's usually said to be about 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's a meter, a little over a yard, which is a little over 3 feet, per second. That many of them. That's very very fast. But this is the speed in a vacuum. If it's moving through another material like glass or plastic or water, it actually moves much slower than that. And when it enters a new medium, it tends to do something we call refraction. It bends, its path changes. It actually bends into the slow material. The analogy we usually give is a car moving along a road and suddenly enters sand. The, this tire right here is going to hit the sand first, slow down while this tire is still going faster. So this side of the car is going faster while this one goes slow, it's actually going to turn this way. It turns into the slow material a bit. You see its angle changes. And we can think of light waves doing the exact same thing, going from air to glass. This side of the wave hits, slows down. This side keeps going. It twists in and changes its path. That's known as refraction. Next up is Snell's Law. This fairly simple but very useful law lets us predict how light behaves when it moves from one medium to another. So we have N1 times the sine of angle 1 equals N2 times the sine of angle 2. Here, angle 1 over here is the incident angle, so the incoming angle. Both start with I. That's how you can remember it. And this angle, all angles are measured from what we call the normal line. It's the line perpendicular to the surface of the material. And it's pretty important to remember. You don't want to measure it from down here, up here. So, we have this instant angle. It's always going to be the same as the reflected angle, because sum is usually reflected once you hit a surface. It's reflected off at exactly the same angle it came in. But sum travels through, becomes refracted. And this is the refracted angle down here, angle 2. And you may be wondering, What's this N1, N2 business? Well, those are something called the index of refraction, one for each material. It's a property of the material, which I'll get into in the next slide. So what is index of refraction? Index of refraction is basically just how much a certain material slows down light. Its actual value is just the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in glass. So if you were just talking about the, vac the speed of light in a vacuum, its index of refraction would be 1. Vacuum over vacuum. So the higher up you go, the more that material slows down light. It's just based on the, atomic the actual physical molecular structure of it. But why does light slow down? Okay, yes, we know there's an index of refraction, and that tells us how much it slows, but doesn't tell us anything about why. Well, in addition to light being thought of as a wave, it can also be thought of as a particle. This is confirmed with the double slit experiment that basically says light is a wave or a particle depending on when we need it to be for our experiment. Now, the electrons around an atom tend to absorb passing photons. They do this to jump to higher energy levels within the atom before they fall back down and re-emit the photons back out. They do this all the time. And in a material, there's a lot of atoms and a lot of electrons, so light traveling through is probably going to be stopped quite a few times. If you ever had to stop while running somewhere, it's a lot slower than just running through uninterrupted. So there we have a photon zipping by, nothing to stop it, goes really quickly. But now, let's add an electron in the way. Gets excited, absorbs, re-emits, 
slows it down on its path. You can imagine how if you put a bunch of those in the way, it would go a lot slower. So a th really dense, thick material has a lot of atoms, a lot of electrons to get in the way, it will have a higher index of refraction. Next up, dispersion and prisms. So when electrons make their little jumps between energy levels, they usually need a very specific energy to do so. So they absorb photons of a very specific energy. And this means a very specific wavelength, since wavelength ties into energy. Now, photons close to this wavelength are more likely to interact when they move through a material that has a lot of atoms, electrons, in a certain setup. So they're more likely to interact. That means of all the electrons that pass, they're going to interact with them more often, slows them down. They have a lot more things in their way. So the crystal of a prism interacts most strongly with wavelengths close to the ultraviolet range. This means violet, which is most close to ultraviolet, is actually going to be refracted more than red light. And all the ones in between are going to be refracted at slightly different rates. So actually, the index of refraction of light varies a bit with wavelength, which basically means color. So different colors of light, refracted different amounts, will take different paths through a prism. And this is called dispersion. We can separate out all of the colors from white light. Since white light is just all the colors together, we actually spread them out because they're each being refracted by slightly different amounts. And sadly, this picture down here is not entirely accurate to physics, as usually the violet is supposed to be on the bottom here because it's refracted most and the red is up on top. I should also mention total internal reflection. And you can recreate this at home if you have a waterproof flashlight in a bathtub. It's actually quite fun. So, say you have a flashlight down here. You shine it up at the surface. Now, some light is going to be reflected back in. It's not just reflected going from light into water. It's reflected whenever you change boundaries. So some is reflected back down here, some is refracted. The angles of refraction are just given by Snell's law. But as you increase the angle here, you start cha severely changing the angle of refraction. Once you pass a certain critical angle, this angle of refraction is over 90 degrees. It's actually back down into the material. You don't get any refraction here. It's completely and totally reflected. None of it gets out. None of it can get out. It's trapped in here as long as it's hitting at this angle. And this is quite important to how fiber optic cables are made. It's how we can trap light in these little tubes of plastic so we can pump them wherever we want them to go. It's just still much faster even going through the slowed down plastic than a regular electrical signal would be. So, this brings us to the million dollar question. Where do rainbows come from? So, sunlight is dispersed by refraction when it enters a water droplet. Light up here enters the water droplet. Light up here. Goes in, reflects off the back end. Comes back here. Refracts on its way back out. We've now spread them out a bit is usually coming out at 42 degrees, this is 40 degrees. So, your eye is catching the red light from this droplet and the violet light from this droplet. Violet light misses here. So you have this whole band of droplets that you're catching a single color from. That's why you see these big bands of color across the sky. They're made up of little bits of water droplets that are all sending a specific wavelength of light to your eye. Of course, if you move your eye, say you move your eye down here, you catch the red from this one, you'll catch the violet from one below that, and you won't be seeing that one anymore. So the image is, of the rainbow is actually going to move down with you. Same for any direction you move. This is why if you try to chase a rainbow, it'll always run away from you and you can't catch it. Some more information about rainbows. They're only visible with the sun to your back. 
they form around this thing called the anti-solar point, which is basically a line from your head to where it would cast a shadow. This is because the light has to go in into the water droplet and reflect off the back to come back to you. So, if you can look in the direction that your your head casts a shadow, find the the line to the anti-solar point, and look about 42 degrees up from there, or 42 degrees to the side, anywhere in a 42 degree arc. You'll see the primary rainbow. And this angle is important because it's the angle that works out best for getting the most internal reflection off the back of that water droplet while still reaching your eye. And they form these arcs here but they would form entire circles, it's just that the ground gets in the way. If you're ever actually up in an airplane and look down and manage to see a rainbow, it will actually look like a circle. Kind of like this. And now for the question you've all probably been wondering since the very beginning. Double rainbow, what does it mean? It's actually quite simple. A secondary rainbow is formed when light reflects twice inside a water droplet. So we have sunlight coming here, hits near the bottom, refracts this way, reflects up, reflects over here, and refracts again on its way back out. And this we get usually up in this 50 to 52 degree range where the secondary rainbow forms. 40 to 42 for the primary, 50 to 52 for the secondary. In between we have what's called Alexander's Dark Band is where none of the angles really work out for light to get to your eye. Either none of the light really reaches you, or it cancels out with other water droplets, or one color might reach you, but it'll be mixed with a bunch of others, so you'll just see ordinary white light, but not the right angles to disperse it and get one from each droplet. And this secondary rainbow is much dimmer than the first one. If you've ever seen a double rainbow, the secondary one is very dim, because you lose light every time you reflect here. Some still goes through at the other end. It's not completely perfect total internal reflection. You bleed some out with each reflection. So by the time it gets to you, the light has become very dim indeed. This is why for a triple rainbow, it would be very hard to see one. It would have to be a very, very bright day. All right, with that out of the way, let's delve a bit deeper into rainbow philosophy. The following is, is an excerpt from a po poem called Lamia by John Keats. If you've never heard of John Keats, he was a big kickstarter of the romantic poet movement. He also really didn't like Newton. A lot of the romantics were kind of rebelling against the whole age of reason. Their science had, they felt science had been taken away from the beauty of nature by explaining things too much. He was particularly mad at Newton, who had done all the work in optics to explain how rainbows are formed. So he wrote this. Do not all charms fly at the mere touch of cold philosophy? There was an awful rainbow once in heaven. We know her woof, her texture she has given, in the dull catalogue of common things. Philosophy will clip an angel's wings, conquer all mysteries by rule and line, empty the haunted air and gnomed mine, unweave a rainbow as it erewhile made, the tender personed lamia melt into a shade. So yeah, he was a little torn up that science kept coming up with all these explanations and then all of his fantasies didn't work because the rainbow story wasn't quite as nice as the story he was told of Sugar and Spice. But I much prefer instead a quote by Richard Feynman, one of the amazing physicists of the 1970s. And he says, Poets say science take away Science takes away from the beauty of the stars, mere globs of gas atoms. Nothing is mere. I too can see the stars on a desert night and feel them, but do I see less or more? The vastness of the heavens stretches my imagination. Stuck on this carousel, my little eye can catch one million year old light. A vast pattern, of which I am a part. What is the pattern or the meaning or the why? It does not do harm to the mystery to know a little more about it. For far more marvelous is the truth than any artist of the past imagined it. Why do the poets of the present not speak of it? What men are poets who can speak of Jupiter if he were a man, but if he is an immense spinning sphere of methane and ammonia must be silent? And that's why 
I prefer quotes of scientists.